Good morning, church. So good to gather with you this morning. Would you stand? And let's worship our good God together this morning. This song is forever yours, a 
Most of the family events that First Lubbock has. So we went to the block party. Um, it was really enjoyable. We had hamburger and hot dog and then she played in the park and had a snow cone and had a good time with her friends. And uh, we went to the corn maze and what did we do at the corn maze? We went through the maze and, and we went on the... On the trailer? Yeah. Yeah. And we made s'mores. I've just felt so welcomed at First Lubbock, like just as a single mom. They just provide us so many opportunities, you know, that maybe we wouldn't get to do normally. But also they just, it feels like family here. So, and it's been that way, like even when I went through some hard times in my life, like First Lubbock has always been there for me. So, and pretty much helped me raise her. So like things like the corn maze and the block party, even just the smallest thing is like, having the snow cones there, you know what I mean? Like sometimes you just don't have the finances for things like that. Um, and so even just something as simple as a snow cone is like such a blessing because, you know, I can't always do those things for her. So the church has helped me out a lot in that way too. I think these events are important because it really just helps bond you as a family, number one. and. And number two, you just actually get to like be a community with your church and get to know others and get involved in the church. And it just helps us keep, you know, coming back and, and really just teaching her the importance of how important Jesus Christ is and to put him as our center. If you agree that Jesus is worthy of praise in spite of circumstances, would you stand to your feet and let's sing this together. Every fear I lay at your feet And I 
Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows and you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. And nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows and you win every battle. Yes, you do. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power. Like this. 
is Jesus, the light of the world. There's freedom in His name. He's awesome in power, reigning forever. Light of the world. There's freedom in His name. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Light of the world, there's freedom in His name. He's awesome in power, reigning forever. Light of the world, there's freedom in His name. There's never been a love so great. He died so we could live. Then He rose up from that grave. Now all authority Whoever belongs to Him He reigns in victory Name another King His name like this like this Name another King like this His name read a song to you. This comes from Isaiah's prophecy. This comes at a point in his prophecy where God's people have been saved and they're singing this song. He says, in that day, everyone in the land of Judah will sing this song. Our city is strong. We are surrounded by the walls of God's salvation. Open the gates to all who are righteous and allow the faithful to enter. You, God, will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Trust in the Lord always, for the Lord God is the eternal rock. This eternal rock who saves is dependable. We can put our hope, we can put our confidence in him. He's on the throne. He is king, and he always comes through church. We want to teach you this new song this morning. Let's sing to our King of kings and Lord of
Johnny and, and Ben for leading us and ushering us in uh, in some worship. It is always a, a privilege to get to speak during this hour, and I'm, I trust that God's going to do some great things. I'll, I'll echo Josh before I begin, and God did some really cool things this weekend, and, and I'd encourage you to, to find somebody with one of these shirts and, and just say, tell me what God did in, in your life this weekend. Um, when I was a kid, I played a game. And it's a, a great game because all it takes is a little strip of paper. And you can make it almost anywhere. And I had friends that told me the First Baptist Duncanville bulletins worked perfectly for this. But I was busy taking notes in sermons, so I wouldn't know. Uh, I heard it also is good for paper airplanes. But you can use any old paper. And you just kind of fold it over each corner. And we call this game paper football. It's a simple game, not many rules. You just kind of flick it back and forth across the table and the goal being to let just an edge or a corner hang off the side of a table so that if the other person runs their finger along the edge, they may move it. And you, you fold it pretty simply and you, you tuck it in in the end and if you get it there, you, you get a touchdown. And then the real fun begins because you get to kick a field goal. Now you may have played wrong and you used your pointer fingers for the field goal and gave a big old wide one with your fingers out and your thumbs up, but that's for chumps. The real football players went thumbs to the middle and pointer fingers up, and the face is in direct line of shot. So if you're a good, can, can make a real tight paper football, you can really wear somebody out when it comes to kicking field goals. Now, you know that this isn't real football. You've seen real football. It's it's really just barely even a, a picture of real football, but it's, it's a good game. It's, it's fun. It's something you can do pretty easily, pretty cheaply, and, and with almost a, a no effort, but it's not real football. But now, imagine if you never heard of football, never seen football, and this was your first experience, then, 
maybe you might think this is as good as it gets. You might think this is truly football. That this is a game that that you've maybe heard rumors about. This must be what they were talking about. A letter of Hebrews is written to a group of believers who primarily have come out of Judaism and have accepted Jesus' message of salvation. But now they find themselves persecuted, both from the outside, the Roman world. We have Nero and Domitian leading at this time, two of the most evil men to walk this planet. But even from some of their relatives that remained in Judaism and find it dumbfounding that they would abandon this faith of their ancestors to follow this new guy from Nazareth. And nothing good can come from Nazareth, right? And so the letter is, is penned as an encouragement. Not to say all the things that came before were worthless but simply that they were shadows of the ultimate reality that God was building towards in Jesus. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 8 this morning. He begins by saying, now the main point in what we are saying is this. I think you lose a point for putting the lead eight chapters in. But it's helpful when the author says, and here's what I'm getting at, because at times scripture can be a bit elusive. Now, the the point with what we have been saying, one through seven, read it, is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens author of Hebrews can paint a picture of glory pretty well. A minister in the sanctuary and the true tent that the Lord and not any mortal has set up. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Hence it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They offer worship in a sanctuary that is a sketch and shadow of the heavenly one. For Moses, when he was about to erect the tent, was warned, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. But Jesus has now obtained a more excellent ministry, And to that degree, he is a mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted through better promises. There's a lot there. A lot of talk about covenant. So let's first of all address what the covenant was. In Genesis, God arranges a covenant between him and Abram. It begins as a fairly normal covenant, though maybe a bit bizarre to us. They take a, an animal and they split it nose to tail, straight down the middle, place half on one side, half on the other. And then this is where things get weird. God passes through as a burning pot and Abram sleeps through the whole thing. Now, it would have been normal to perform a covenant in this way. You, you take a sacrifice, you split it nose to tail, you put it on either side, and what you are saying in effect is that we are agreeing to something and that if I break this agreement, may the same thing be done to me that was done to this bull. But only God passes through. You see, God knew from the start we could not carry our end of the bargain. That's the original covenant it 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 is brought about and it is uh, shown to the people and it calls from the people then obedience through a sacrificial system you know the story I I suspect of the Old Testament a, a constant roller coaster of obedience and disobedience through the people of Israel 
That's the covenant that these people have known about since the moment they were born. We're not always great here about, uh, not here, people in the West, we're not always great about instilling our children with our faith. We're bringing them to church. It's great, it's important, but instilling our faith in our children is not something we've been historically good at in the West, but Jewish people today, even Orthodox Jews, but certainly in Jesus' time, took very seriously the Pentateuch. His kids knew it well from the moment they were born, and now they're abandoning this covenant. And things are not going well. I suspect there have been moments in your life where you have been faced with a a difficult decision, but in spite of that, you made what you were sure was the right call, and yet things did not work out perfectly. I suspect those that follow Jesus knew without a doubt that this is the Messiah that their ancestors had been waiting for in spite of the fact that so many of their relatives missed it. And yet they find themselves now persecuted and they begin to wonder, were they right all along and did we miss it? So the author is going to remind them that Jesus is better than the angels and Jesus is better than uh, the, uh, the Moses. Jesus is better than the law and now ultimately Jesus is better than even that great covenant. The word we translate better here is used more than twice as many times in Hebrews as it is the rest of the New Testament combined. And I, I suspect Nobody in this room uh, woke up this morning uh, really wrestling in their mind about whether it's Jesus or the angels, which one's better, or Jesus or the law, or even Jesus or the old covenant. But certainly there are things in our life that are good things, but are but shadows of eternity that we have made into ultimate goods that ought not be. It's important to note that all of the things that uh, the author of Hebrews is going to contrast with Jesus are God-given and God-ordained things in the Old Testament, including this covenant. But he says it's been usurped and not by an idol God. I suspect if you've been through temptation, uh, through a trial, it's tempting to assume that maybe we follow an idol God. I-D-L-E. Or we look around and we go, I I trusted and I believe that God is good. It just feels like maybe he's asleep at the wheel here. It just feels like I'm not really seeing him move right now. And I suspect the Hebrews have found themselves there. And so the author wants to remind them, Jesus did not die, raise again, went to heaven and then propped his feet up, reclined that chair, and he's just relaxing until the next step. No, he's performing a function. And actually every function that you associate with worship, he is the sacrifice, he is the priest, he's even the temple. Again, all good things, but Jesus is better. He says Jesus is functioning as a priest. That says a lot. We, we don't call people priests anymore. In fact, one of the distinctives of Baptists is the priesthood of the believer, that we are all priests. But the function of the priest is really relatively simple. Go to God on behalf of people and go to people on behalf of God. That's what the priests did. It says he's a priest. Uh, Hebrews also tells us he's not just a normal priest. That he's a priest that was tempted in every way that you are yet without sin. No other priest could say that. Says he's a priest in the line of Melchizedek. We don't know a lot about Melchizedek, but what we do know about Melchizedek, he wasn't just a normal priest, he was a priest king. We serve a priest king who's able to sympathize with our weakness and is not idly watching and hoping we get it right, but is actively mediating on my behalf and on yours. 
told you this before, but been to a lot of youth camps and sometimes those Thursday night invitations get a, a little bit awry and one of my least favorite manipulative tactics that camp pastors have used in the past is saying things like, it, if you got to heaven and God said, why should I let you in? What would your defense be? That's a good way to get a lot of kids to run down that aisle so you can tell your donors how many you got down there. It's a very unbiblical and manipulative way to share the gospel, but it's a good way to get people down the aisle. But here's, here's the, the truth. If you and I have to offer a defense for why we deserve eternity, we are in big trouble. The most rhetorically gifted person in the room, the, the best uh, uh, debater in the room, the one in the room that wins the most arguments, couldn't win that one. You wouldn't have a chance. But here's what I suspect out of Scripture. You'll never be asked that question. Here's what I can guarantee out of Scripture. If you are, you won't even be able to take in a breath to begin to answer before Jesus says, no, 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 no wait. they're with me. He gives our defense on our behalf. And if that happens, it won't be the first time because it's what he did on the cross. When he ushered in an entirely new kingdom, an entirely new way to worship, an entirely new way to live in this world. When that curtain ripped in two in the temple, it was saying something. It wasn't just a bad stitch. It was ushering in a new way of life for those who claim to know Jesus. Now, part of the reason I, I chose Hebrews is because much like Romans, uh, the author of Hebrews just lives in the Old Testament. And Hebrews chapter 8 says something very powerful that Bobby said a couple weeks ago. And so I want to look at this Jeremiah 31 uh, a passage that he quotes. But I want you to hear very clearly. God did not establish a, a, a covenant with Israel. And God really hope this pans out. God didn't have kids now, but I think I can make something work. And, and I really hope this works out. And then later on, God went, well, shoot, that didn't go the way I thought it would. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start over, but this time we're going to put the big guns and we're going to go with Jesus. That's not how it worked. Jesus is not plan B. Jesus isn't the second plan. There's, there's a second op option, the, the alternative to the original. Jesus was always the plan. And we go, well, then, then what's the deal with the covenant and the law and the sacrificial system? I'm not God and I don't know. And Deuteronomy 29, 29 says the secret things belong to the Lord. But, but maybe the law is there to remind us that even if we had the option of saving ourselves, we'd fail at it. You see, the law does three things. It guides you, it tells you what to do, it curbs you, it tells you what not, what not to do, and then ultimately, it mirrors you and it reminds you that you don't measure up. This was not plan B. God knew from the beginning how he would bring people to himself. And it was always through Jesus. Second half of this chapter. Verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need to look for a second one. God finds fault with them when he says, The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their ancestors, on the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and so I had no concern for them, says the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God. 
and they shall be my people. They shall not teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And speaking of a new covenant, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and growing old will soon disappear. He says, God finds fault because of their disobedience. It is embarrassing the length of our memories when it pertains to the acts of God in our lives. I led them by the hand out of Egypt. But it wasn't long before they're going to Moses and saying, did you really bring us out here to die? It would have been better to remain slaves than to do this. The God of the universe, in a very physical way, there, there was no, no, if you think about it this way, if you squint really hard, it was a pillar of fire leading them. Waters moving so that they could uh, pass on dry land and weeks later they don't remember. And listen, it's easy to throw stones at the Israelites. It's easy to throw stones at the Pharisees. Uh, It's always easy to throw stones at other people. It is embarrassing how quickly we can forget how God has moved in our lives. He says, I led them out of Egypt by hand. But they didn't remain in my covenant. He says, this new covenant won't be like the last one. Instead, I'm going to write it on their minds and on their hearts. The old covenant was primarily outward. Circumcision, the clothes they wore, the food they ate, the sacrifices they made at a public way, at a temple. He says, this new covenant will be internal. Written on your hearts, written on your mind. If you've spent really any time with people who who do not know Jesus, you can trust that they are yearning for something that is written on their hearts. And they may not be able to locate it. They may be convinced. Maybe you spent a season, maybe you're there now, where you're convinced that the next promotion is what will satisfy your heart. Or you're convinced if only you could marry this person, that would satisfy your heart. If only you could get through this difficult season, that would satisfy your heart. It says, no. My truths will be written on your heart, be written in your mind. And then it... A bit of a confusing, right? You don't even have to talk about it. People, everybody will just know. I don't think that's an anti-evangelism message. I think he's just pointing at the innate desire that all people will have for eternity. And I do think we have an obligation to point people, people towards that. In fact, Matthew 28, Jesus told you you do, so you don't take my word for it. But he says this new covenant's going to be something different in response to the disobedience in the old covenant. Which brings us to, if it's all about Jesus, where does that leave you and I? Ought we just pray a prayer, come down or text in, we're going to get dunked, and then we can just continue to live the way we would like because it's all about Jesus. No, no. God takes seriously the disobedience of his people. If there's anything uh, that is so obvious it flies off the pages of the Old and New Testament is that God takes sin seriously. If it wasn't that big, o- that, that big of a deal, then God grossly overpaid for our salvation. If sin's not that big of a deal, then God got ripped off when he sent his son to die, taking on the sins of the world 
so that you and I could live in eternity in the presence of the Father. The worst transaction in history of sin is not that big of a deal. No, as believers, we have a responsibility to live into this new kingdom living in a way that honors the Savior who died so that we can. We have a, an obligation to live in such a way that God is honored by our actions. This weekend at our, our college retreat, we looked at Ephesians 4, where we're reminded that we are to live a life worthy of the manner in which we were called. He even goes so far as to say it's your responsibility to make every effort to that end. This is not a lazy faith. Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, says it, it, it has to cost you something because nothing can be cheap to us that was costly to God. Cost of discipleship. Nothing can be cheap to us that was costly to God and boy was it costly. He says, this, the group that I established my covenant with was led out by hand and immediately forgot. We respond to the salvation of Jesus with nothing other than obedience. To walk in a way that's worthy of the manner that we've been called and our hope is found in that last verse that uh, Jeremiah writes, that we are serving a merciful God. Some of us are still living in the old covenant, and we think if, we're, if we really, really parse out what it is that we believe, that there's some cosmic scale up there that's measuring our goods and bads. And, and what's more um, of a, a travesty than that is you might think you're pretty close to 50-50. We're not anywhere near that. But thank God we serve a merciful Father who blots out iniquity and forgets our sin. They forgot. Not good. He forgets. It's the good news. We serve a God who's merciful. Because listen, folks, we're going to fail before we go to bed tonight. And we'll probably fail between waking up and getting to work or school or whatever it is. And sometimes that can become overwhelming that God's called us to such a high calling and then made it impossible. And it's just, it's just not worth it. He says, no, we serve a merciful God that allows us to live into, that somehow finds our obedience as a sweet fragrance, that somehow takes glory in his people behaving in such a way that reflects God's goodness. That's a high calling. And it's only possible because we serve a merciful Merciful God. I don't know what shadows you've made ultimate realities. What good thing you've made eternal. But I promise you, Jesus is better. The person that walked in this room with the highest most supreme understanding of Jesus' goodness, I have news for you. Jesus is even better than that. Jesus is better than you and I could possibly imagine. And because of that, he's ushered in a new covenant. 
A covenant not based on what you or I can do, but based upon what he did. Right? Not, not based upon the blood of animals that we sacrifice in his name, but based upon the blood of the lamb that was killed for you and for me. And now all we have to do is walk in it. To trust that Jesus really is better than whatever I'm holding on to. To trust that, re- that Jesus really is better whatever, than whatever I've put my hope in. And to say because of that, I'm gonna trust in the goodness of your mercy and I'm gonna simply try to be obedient. If a group this size took seriously the goodness of who Jesus is and began to walk in the freedom of Jesus' goodness, we would, we would wreck this city. Oh, that would wreck them. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> right, we, we, but it would, it would rupture this place. It would shock the entire city. If we started to fill businesses, not with people that go to church on Sunday, but with people that truly understand that Jesus is better. It's not going to be easy. I promise you it's going to be worth it. Let's pray. God, you're so good and you're for my good. I'm so grateful for that. Forgive me when I take it for granted. God, I pray that you would do something in and through the lives of every single body in this room. As we leave this place and go into city and our our workplaces, our homes, Lord, I, I pray that you would do something so big that our only explanation would simply be God did that. In your name I pray. Amen.